Pat was appointed Jefferson Smurfit Professor of Strategic Management in 2003. He graduated with a PhD in Strategic Planning and Policy from the University of Pittsburgh. Before entering academia, he worked in a number of financial and corporate strategy roles with KPMG, Jefferson Smurfit Group, the Investment Bank of Ireland, and Unpust. Um, his current research interests, and Pat, I, I hope I get this right and do you justice, <laughs> in, uh, revolve around control practices of multinational companies, the impact of strategic planning, planning systems on organizational behavior and performance, and the application of social theory to strategic process research. Um, so I've actually never had the pleasure of being lectured by Pat. Um, we, we first kind of met each other in a social capacity on the overseas trip to China, and then he subsequently coached me and um, me and our, our kind of class team to uh, to win the the NBA AI Strategy Forum a couple of years ago as well, for, his, for which he deserves full credit. So I'm really excited um, to hear what he has to say tonight. Thank you very much, Pat. As a friend of mine once said, applause at the beginning of a speech, certainly one of my speeches, is is certainly uh, an act of faith. Applause in the middle an act of hope, and applause at the end is definitely an act of charity. <laughs> so uh, I was just saying earlier, you know, and again, you know, in academia, I'm sure you know, you've, you're all MBA alumni, so you've, you've, uh, you've interacted with academics a lot. And uh, one of the things that academics tend to be very precious about is, of course, our titles. And Siobhan was very kind to identify me as the Jefferson Smurf Professor of Strategic Management, so professor very important, but I'm not sure whether you, you're familiar with Winston Hugh Auden's definition of a professor. Auden, the famous English writer, defined the professor as somebody who talks in somebody else's sleep. <laughs> yeah. uh, hopefully, hopefully we, we, don't, uh, we don't induce son, somnambulance or, or somnolence too, too quickly this evening. Um, and, what, you know, again, uh, for those of you who know me, uh, you, you, thanks for coming for the second speaker. Um, but what I want to do is just run through a couple of slides around uh, some notions around strategic leadership and perhaps how you develop strategic leaders uh, in your organization. And maybe perhaps to, to look at some of these characteristics yourselves and think about um, you know, uh, how do I stack up against some of these characteristics. So really there's a couple of, you know, a couple of themes in the, in the talk. Um, and hopefully we'll tie them together towards the end. So, you know, two, two uh, sort of concepts that are close to my heart. Strategy, basically, you know, what's the objective and how do we achieve the objective? Uh, you know, the, the, fun, the two fundamental questions a strategy really needs to answer. And basically, who's going to then lead the development and so hopefully the successful implementation of the strategy? And that really is a function of, of leadership. So what we want to do is you know, talk about, in a way, why, why is leadership important? What do we mean by strategic leadership? If you are developing a, a leadership development process or a strategic de leadership development process in your organization, what might you do? And you know, how, might the, how might we design a system to develop these competencies? And we look at a couple of examples of, of companies that have tried to do some of these things uh, towards the end. So that's the basic overview of the session. OK? So you know. Just starting off with a quote, uh, Adams, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you're a leader. And I want to sort of highlight some of these words as we go through the presentation. And in particular, uh, perhaps towards the end, talk about learning. Uh, it would be remiss of me as a, coming from an educational institution if I didn't really speak about uh, the importance of learning, and certainly the importance of learning uh, in the context of leadership and leadership development. Okay? Now, I know you're busy people, so you don't have access to the works of Publius Cirrus every day. Um, but nonetheless, I think, you know, again, some of, the, some of the quotes that I'd like to weave through and sort of parse my presentation along with would be around, you know, anyone can hold a helm when the sea is calm. Reason and judgment of the qualities of a leader. Leadership and learning are indispensable to each other and innovation distinguishes between a leader and a follower. And I suppose these are sort of four quotes that I thought were interesting. And I think what I'd like to do, or what I will do, is we'll try and weave some of our, our presentation in around some of these quotes. Schumacher, uh, in January 2013, very interesting paper in HBR, tried to identify sort of six facets 
or six characteristics of strategic leaderships, of strategic leaders, and the uh, essential skills of strategic leaders. The first was, you know, anticipate, challenge, interpret, decide, align, and learn. And in a way, what he was talking about with anticipation was, you know, basically uh, sensitizing our antennae to uh, changes that are happening in the environment. So, you know, he talks about talk to your customers, suppliers, look at fast growing rivals, and examine actions that puzzle you, attend conference events in other industries. So, again, some very practical stuff about how to, if you like, enhance one's sensitivity to the world around us. Challenge. Apply the five whys, you know, the old, was it Honda or Toyota, where, you know, if you ask why five times in succession, you eventually get to the root of the problem. So, you know, encouragement around there. List long-standing assumptions about your business and ask a group you trust to see if they still hold, still hold true. Encourage debate. Create a roving position of devil's advocate, okay? And the emphasis here being on roving as opposed to the self-appointed devil's advocate. I don't know how often you've been at meetings where you hear the following refrain, well, I'll play devil's advocate because I'm really good at that. Okay. And that's great. And then a week later, you hear the same thing. And a week after that, you hear the same thing. And of course, what happens three weeks later, four weeks later, five weeks later is the self-appointed devil's advocate is totally ignored. And that's potentially dangerous because the devil's advocacy role is important. It's important to challenge. It's important to, to critique. But what you want to make sure, of course, is that the position is roving and it's not the self-appointed narc who basically engages in the position. Interpret. When analyzing ambiguous data, force yourself to come up with at least three interpretations. And the reason that's important is, and we'll come on to it in a few moments, is that we are hardwired to have certain biases in the way we make decisions. We are absolutely hardwired to do that, so therefore we will make error in decision making. So multiple interpretations can if you like, help overcome some biases that we are hardwired to produce in our decision making. Decide. You know, we're all decision makers, we're all managers, of course we know how to decide. But typically what we, de what, we to what we do to decide is we sort of decide around binary decisions. Or if we're developing strategy, we think of our objective and we think about what strategy do we need to deliver our objective and we think about one strategy. And we don't think about multiple strategies or alternatives. And premature closure on a single strategy okay, can again lead to sort of dysfunctional outcomes. Creativity is enhanced when we look at multiple alternatives and try and blend alternatives together. Align. Communicate early and often to avoid no one told me, no one asked me. Reach out to resistors directly to understand their concerns. Use structured meetings to understand concerns. I, I know our subsequent speaker tonight is going through a very significant process of alignment uh, within the public sector. And yet, you know, naturally there's resistance. And typically when we meet resistance, we try to avoid or you know, one, one pathology is to avoid it. But again, I think what, Schum what Schumacher is trying to say here is, you know, that really, you know, you need to sort of directly address resistors to really understand their concerns and try to address them. And then, of course, learn. You know, the old US Army trick, the AAR the after action review. So after every significant action, there's a review. What did we learn from the process? What did we learn from the action? What did we learn from the practice? Okay? So not just after action, of course, reviews. You could have pre-mortems as well. So instead of the post-mortem, you have the pre-mortem. Well, if everything goes pear-shaped, what would we do? Well, how could everything go pear-shaped? So well, I'll come back to this later on because we'll sort of interweave some, some, some little hopefully some thoughts around these things as we, as we go through the presentation. So these were the six sort of essential skills of strategic leaders that Schumacher has come up with, and I think they're fairly interesting. <coughs> Why is leadership important? Okay, you can never go wrong with a McKinsey study. All right, so McKinsey, McKinsey uh, sort of came up with did this survey, and what are the most important organizational capabilities for managing corporate performance through the current economic crisis and after the current economic crisis? Okay, and the number one, I know it's hard to read because it's a screenshot, leadership. Ability to ensure that leaders shape and inspire the actions of others to drive better performance. Okay, exactly Quincy Adams's quote. The ability to sort of shape and inspire the actions of others and provide direction, the capacity to articulate where the company is heading and how to get there and to align people appropriately. Critically, the strategic problem. So why is strategic leadership important? Leadership is important to ensure that leaders shape and inspire the actions of others, but shape and inspire the actions of others in what direction? 
the direction that's provided to by the objectives and the strategy. So to me, in very interesting findings around the essential ingredients for organizational success, I would think, high quality leadership and a well-defined, well-articulated objective and a well-articulated and crafted strategy. Reason and judgment are the qualities of a leader. Well, if reason and judgment are the qualities of a leader, what are the things that could impair our reason <coughs> and our judgment? And the things that can impair our, re our, our reason and judgment are the systematic biases that we suffer in making decisions. And we know about these systematic biases, and we know they exist, and as I say, we know we are hardwired to make these mistakes. We all tend to use what's called the availability heuristic. The best example of the availability heuristic, of course, is, let's say, and I know some of the people will do a systematic evaluation of this uh, talk, okay? And let's say the dean, my boss, gets the, the quantitative data from the assembled group here this evening. And then somebody walks down and meets the dean and says, Pat Gibbons put me to sleep. And the systematic data says it was great. Guess what he'll remember? <coughs> Forget the systematic data. We tend to rely on data that's available to us. And we tend to ignore systematic data. We also have a tendency to look for data that confirms our presuppositions. And we tend to discount data that disconfirms our presuppositions. We tend to define and attend to problems based on our disciplinary backgrounds. So you know, the classic one about the engineer and the psychologist in the hotel, and the lifts are going up and down, and people are complaining about waiting for the lift, and the engineer is really trying to figure out how to accelerate the movement of the lift, and the psychologist puts a mirror beside the lift shaft so that people don't attend to the waiting time. But we tend, we have a tendency to define problems based on what's called functional fixation. <laughs> Accountants define problems in accounting terms. Production people tend to define problems in production terms. Stability biases, sunk cost effects, what's still amazing, we all learn about sunk costs. I don't want to bring up uh, bad memories of management accounting or anything like that. But, <laughs> Okay, but nonetheless, you know, we do suffer from some cost effects. Well, we've invested so much, surely another, goal, another roll of the dice will surely make it all the, come good. And then in group situations, we have social biases. Okay, how do we treat dissent? How do we treat people who disagree with us? Okay, in group situations, how do we do that? Do we listen to them or do we discount what they're saying? So again, you know, these biases are basically systematic in the way we make decisions. And if reason and judgment are the critical things for decision making, then what we have to do is think about, first of all, knowledge of these biases becomes important because with self-awareness of these biases, we know how to address them. But systematically reviewing when we're making a decision, is it likely that we are falling into any of these decision traps? Can be important. My favorite one, leadership and learning are indispensable, indispensable to each other from uh, John Kennedy. Okay? How many of us engage in the strategy development process? Or have ever engaged in the strategy development process in our companies? Sure. Thank you. Okay? Now, the one thing we can think about, and the one thing that rarely happens in most strategy development processes, rarely, I'm not saying yours, I, I just in my, in my experiences, that they're not seen as, as opportunities for learning. And learning about what? Well, learning about your industry, learning about your company, learning about what drives current performance, learning about how do we address future capability. In other words, typically our planning processes are far from inquiry based. They are not directed at inquiring about these things. Instead, they're directed at maybe ticking boxes, maybe filling out forms, maybe getting the process done as quickly as possible so that we can get onto the important stuff. Okay? But again, in thinking about strategy and thinking about leadership, I think what we have to do is overturn our traditional approaches to strategy development and think about rather than filling out forms, rather than going through some sort of systematic, highly ritualized, time-bound process, how do we make it an inquiry-based process? In other words, how do we expand our knowledge of the universe of what's happening out there, what's happening in our competitors, 
what should we be doing in our company, what's preventing success in our company, and what really drives success in our company. Okay, so again, thinking about you know, strategy as a learning process, but continuing this sort of learning, you know, some questions that we might reflect on after our strategy development process. What did I learn about my industry and its environment? What did I learn about my company? What did I learn about strategy? What did I learn about my team and its dynamics? In other words, at the end of any strategy development process, I think some of the reflective questions <coughs> that we could be asking is, would really help us design better processes and hopefully design and execute better strategies if we approach the process, if we approach the problem, the strategy problem, as one that can be resolved through an inquiry process. Skip that. So again, the, the critical thing here, and the reason I, I want to bring this up is that, you know, how do we learn? Well, we learn from, you know, the after action review in the US Army. They have a concrete experience. They reflect on why it happened. What, why did it happen? What happened? Why did it happen? They try to explain why things happen. And they try to think about what will they do differently next time. Okay? A good systematic approach to, do, to learning. My one observation I'd make is, when do we normally do this? When do we normally go through this cycle? We normally go through, through this cycle when there's a big screw up, when there's a big mistake. We have a, an audit. Okay? But in fact, what we should be doing is, rather that, that's sort of learning from mistakes, which is vitally important. But it's equally important to learn from success, because we, we sometimes think after successful events, well, obviously things went as planned. Obviously the outcome was assured. Well, it's not obvious. Okay? You could be lucky. Okay? And so it's vitally important that if you have this inquiry-based, learning-based approach, to think about, well, what contributes to success and what's contributed to failure. And the reason I say that is, you know, the, 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 our friend uh, Schumacher, the last point in terms of the criticality of the six essential skills, learning is one of them. So how do we go about learning becomes an important, an important issue. So if we want to develop strategic leadership in our organization, interesting book, I, I like this book. Connerty was the head of uh, G, uh, HR and GA. Sharon is, a, is an academic. And you know, some of the bullet points from it, you know, sort of attracting, developing, and retaining world-class talent is a never-ending task, okay? Uh, think of shortcomings as development needs rather than fatal flaws. Differentiation, in other words, in performance evaluation in particular. <laughs> Differentiation breeds meritocracy. Sameness, uh, meritocracy, sameness breeds me mediocrity. And w great leaders build great succession plans. I mean, one of the, a company that I'm working with at the moment, where we had a meeting last week, and one of the big issues in the meeting was we had the senior leadership team, and we were thinking about what's the succession plan. There were 15 people on the leadership team, and there was a, a succession plan for one person, which is you know, an incredible risk. So again, in, in organizations, you have to be thinking about, okay, if management is really important, if leadership is really important, then the pipeline of leadership becomes vitally important. And how are you developing that pipeline of leadership becomes vitally important. So how do we develop? Well, are people ready for promotion or ready for advancement? What experiences can we give them to develop their career? What exper those experiences should be about two things. We need to provide them with a challenge, and vitally we need to provide them with the support. Because if you want to develop leadership talent, the critical thing is they need to build self-efficacy, self-confidence. And the last thing you want to do is to give them a really challenging task and then no support. <laughs> because the risk of failure is high. And if the risk of failure is high, they won't, build they won't build motivation, they won't build self-efficacy. So the critical thing in developing any leadership sort of pipeline is to begin to think about what are the types of experiences that my leaders or my high potentials need to have? How do I give them those experiences? And what are the vital supports they're going to need so that we set them up to win as opposed to setting them up to fail? So that's, and that really becomes important. And then naturally, the individual themselves needs to be able to look back at these experiences and think about, well, what worked well, what didn't work well, and so on. In other words, to learn from the experience. Because why? Learning is not automatic. You don't just get it from the experience. You have to actually actively engage and think through the experience, what worked, what didn't work, and so on, to really learn from experience. It is not an automatic process. Think about your high potentials. Think about the people you want to develop. You know, what are the ways we can get 
what are the, the sort of development strategies we can put in place? Well, we need to think about challenging job assignments, putting them on task forces, role modeling, offering them coaching, hardships, 360 feedback, and the last one, I would, it would be totally remiss of me if I didn't say, send it to the Smurfit School for some development. <laughs> okay? That's the only ad you're going to hear this evening. All right? But what's vital is some reflection at the end of it. Okay? So thinking about your high potentials, thinking about your succession plan, thinking about the people who might succeed you in your position. Okay? What strategies have you selected for this person? What learning tactics? What type of feedback? What type of support? Who will be involved? So again, you know, I know this looks like an engineering sort of uh, process, that we're sort of engineering this, and in a way we are. Okay? What we're thinking about is thinking systematically about how do you develop the leadership pipeline in your organization? How do we ensure that those leaders are developed, and how do, you, how do we ensure that they enhance their self-efficacy, their confidence, and that they're successful? And that has to be thought through in a very systematic manner. Two things, some of you uh, are sufficiently recent in the MBA. One of the cases I teach is about GE under Rimmelt and what GE has done to develop leadership. And I think what's, what's interesting is that the, the couple of slides from GE, what I like about them is they have a systematic process for doing things. And part of the systematic process that, are, that Imelt tried to develop, Imelt inherited the... Sorry, you just... Uh, Imelt inherited a fantastic company from his predecessor, Welsh, but what Imelt decided to do was, rather than grow by acquisition, what I wanted to do was grow organically. In order to grow organically, I needed a different type of leader. And what he, so he decided was, he identified a set of competencies that he felt growth leaders needed to have, and he did some research on this and so on. And the things he thought they needed to have was, first of all, the leaders needed to have be externally focused, thinking about their markets. They need to be clear thinking to make decisions and communicate priorities. Direction setting that we saw earlier from the McKinsey study. They need to have imagination and courage to take risks. They need to be inclusive and they need to have domain expertise. So they need to be experts in some particular area, such as aircraft engines or light bulbs or whatever. But they need to be not just, function, not just generalists. They need to have some level of depth of expertise. And naturally, as usual, he sort of, they sort of assessed people against these competencies and so on. And the way they, the way they did it was, and the way, the way I like it is, if you look at session C, anyone here from GE? <coughs> anyone here from GE? XGE. They're great. So, you know, a very systematic approach to doing things. But one of the things, if, if I believe the rhetoric, and I spoke to some people about, in GE about this, this session C is, <coughs> happens twice in the year. And what session C is really about is, it's thinking about, you know, first of all, the performance of the manager, the performance of the leader, and secondly, it's thinking about the succession plan for that leader, and thinking about how are we developing the people who will succeed the leader. So it's looking two levels down. And what, what I like about this is, you know, the growth playbook is basically the strategic plan, and the operating plan is the budget. And what I like about this is, there's a, an attempt at connecting three critical critically sort of vital processes in the organization. One is the sort of leadership development succession plan, the second is the strategic plan, and the third is the budget. So there's an attempt to link these three elements together. And I think that's, again, we tend to think about leadership development as something that HR are responsible for. But in fact, it's vitally important for the organization, not just HR's responsibility. Us as managers have to develop our leadership talent. And what this reminds us of is that leaders deliver results and they deliver strategies, so think about those three activities in an integrated fashion. Anyone here work for Henkel? Okay, so this gentleman, Rorsted, was appointed CEO about four years ago, and Henkel is a family-oriented German firm. They make the uh, Purcell, I think, isn't it? And uh, the, some adhesives, is that right? So the human lever is a critical driver of change and wants to create a performance-oriented culture. So no, so they need to combine performance and development dimensions. And again, I'm not, this is not rocket science in any way, but I think one of the key levers he found in the organization, or he, he del delivered in the organization, was a sort of a two-by-two two matrix. Okay, and those of you in HR will, may critique this, but one dimension, of course, is performance, and it's a forced rating scale, so you're allocated certain proportions here, okay? And the other dimension, is basically potential, okay? And I think, again, what this sort of, I'm not suggesting we run out and have force rating scales in every organization we work in or anything like that, but what it does identify is that you can have very strong performers 
who are at the right level. Now, what you want to do is encourage to continue to be strong performers. And you can also have people, you know, okay, naturally who are strong performers and have significant potential, but that they are, you know, in a way, to a certain extent, orthogonal dimensions. All right? That some people may be high potential and hopefully they're performing well, but they, they are really high flyers and high potential, and that's not the same as a current high performer. It's not quite the same as a current high performer. So thinking about potential and performance uh, as two orthogonal dimensions, I think, begins to, to be important. Back to this. So that means the good news is coming. All right, <laughs> I'm finished. Anticipate, challenge, interpret, decide, align, learn. Guess, one which I, guess which one I think is the most important of those six essential skills. Go figure. The, learn. Learn. Okay? And the reason learn is, I think, is the most important because you can learn to align better, you can learn to decide better, you can learn to interpret better, you can learn to challenge better, and you can learn to anticipate better. But if you can't learn, there's going to be little change in any of these. So the ability to learn, the systematic ability to learn, to me, becomes the most important variable in your own development, <coughs> naturally, and in leadership development more generally. And having a systematic approach to how we learn so that we decide better, we interpret better, we challenge better, becomes vitally important. Thanks a lot.